short story. Um, I met Sarah uh, a few months ago and she told this like really interesting story about data and how it could affect your life. Um, and I'd like to present our next speaker, Ms. Sarah Watson. Okay. So formal with a handshake. But. <laughs> so if you asked me about a little bit more than a year ago if uh, where I thought I would be today, uh, I would not have said Singapore and I would not have said at this conference. Um, but I moved to Singapore uh, in the last year and uh, when I told my friends that I was moving to Singapore, I would say, well, I feel like I'm moving to the future. There's so much going on with technology and smart nation stuff and sensors everywhere. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, but it seems to suggest that I'm not very good at predicting the future if I had no vision for, for ending up in Singapore. Um, so, uh, but I do have a vision of what my future me looks like. And I think my future me looks like data. My future me is made up of all this personal information about me, but it's not just my personally identifiable information, like my birth date or um, my FIN number or my uh, uh, passport number. Those things are obviously important and personal data, but my data is also made up of all the ways that I'm spending time every day on my phone, just hanging out, playing, wasting time. So some of that really matters. It, it matters to pay attention to that play data. So some examples of this kind of data are, I'm using Spotify all the time. Apparently for three or 38,000 minutes last year, according to Spotify. So what kind of data am I creating when I'm using Spotify all the time? Uh, a lot of that will have impact into uh, what Spotify chooses to play for me next. Um, but it will also potentially say something about my taste and who I am and what my demographics are. If I'm using a Microsoft Connect uh, to play, what is this, Dance, Dance Central, um, I'm creating data about my body. Uh, so my body is kind of being turned into data so that I can play this game. And it also means that I'm creating data in my living room or about what's ho happening in my living room. So Microsoft knows this. They went recently and patented uh, an interactive advertising uh, feature that would interject and, and make you jump up and say the name of the brand before you can continue playing. And obviously they're not using this yet, but it's a proof of concept and, you know, uh, patent form, but it's saying something a lot about what our future of our play as what our future of play is as it's uh, commercialized and, and consumed. I'm also creating a lot of data with my friends. So this might not be that meaningful right now, but for researchers who look at social networks, this is actually pretty meaningful. So it's been proven that uh, if looking at a social network of people, uh, it's possible to accurately predict someone's sexual preferences based on their network. So if I don't say anything about what my sexual preferences are on Facebook, it's still possible based on who my friends are to, for that to say something about who I am. And so it's important to think about how even just hanging out with my friends creates data about me, on, especially when it's turned into a network like this. There's also a bunch of data that goes into telling me which movie I should watch. So in the United States, pretty recently, um, they, the people who were advertising for Straight Out of Compton, which apparently I guess was here in Singapore as well at the projector, um, they were advertising for this movie about, I think it's NWA, uh, for people based on two factors, right? They had two trailers for the same movie. And they were targeting people based on whether or not, uh, basically, they were in an African-American ethnic group. And this was on Facebook. 
And Facebook basically has introduced uh, ethno ethnographic or ethnic affinity groups. And to me, that sounds a little bit like racial profiling. When it's about a movie, it's one thing, but what if that same information, those same inferences about what people's preferences are, could be applied to something more important than just movies? When I'm thinking about future me, I'm also thinking about future of how we're playing and how my future children, which don't, who don't exist yet, uh, might be playing. So when uh, Hello Barbie just came out in the past year, um, she talks to you. So she has this uh, interaction and can respond and listen to uh, the person playing with Barbie and she'll ask you uh, what you want to be when you grow up. And so my future kids will be able to have this kind of conversation, but then that information is uploaded to the cloud and it also means that I can get, as a parent, a readout of what my, conver my, what my kids' conversations with Barbie are. It also means that Mattel has that information. So what happens to my kid when she goes off and decides you know, to apply for college or apply for jobs? Does what she said, is it possible for what she said when she was seven to impact what she does in the future? So I will say all of the ways that data is making our play experience better are awesome. There's, there's nothing wrong with kind of using this information to give me a better recommendation about the next song I'm going to hear on Spotify or which movie I'm going to watch next. But uh, as a technology critic, I'm always thinking about what might go wrong or what's kind of in the works when things are taken out of one context and moved into another context. So I started asking myself, well, how am I being played in this situation? And to do that, I often think about, I put myself in the position of the company to think about what their incentives are and what they are trying to do. So we have all this, uh, these tools, and a lot of how they're designed really influences uh, how we use them. So we're spending time on our mobile phones. And the reason that we spend more time there is because these systems are designed for infinite scroll. They're, they're auto-playing videos to kind of capture your attention. Facebook advertising describes this as uh, an ad that gets you to stop scrolling. It's called a thumb stopper. They, they have a title or a name for this. Um, so that's just kind of the way that they're thinking about how to keep your attention and keep you, keep you going. And that's becoming even more personalized to you. So not only is it based on all your data and they're keeping track of the way that you're interacting with the system, but they're also feeding it back to you. So Eric Schmidt has said that it's going to be nearly impossible to not have a personalized interaction with everything that you interact with in the future. So even your search results right now are adjusted based on your, previ your previous searches and the things you've clicked on and, uh, and so on. And he has said, basically, all of our experiences are going to be slightly personalized in some way. But so what does that mean? Does that create a filter bubble, as it's been called? Does it mean that I only see the things that I like? And yeah, maybe that sounds wonderful, but it also has some implications for how diverse I look, uh, the information I receive is. If I, in the United States, am a Republican, I would be only seeing Trump things and have no influence over seeing, um, seeing anything from the other side in my newsfeed if that's how these systems are built. And so because these systems are so driven by our data now, it's also becoming more clear just how valuable that data is to people. It is to companies. And it turns out that your personal data can say a whole lot about you. So this uh, little quiz was actually drawn from, I think, a research study that was about the inferences that can be made about who you are based on the apps that you have on your phone. So when I took it, it said that I was a single lady, younger than 32, who makes more than 50,000 K a year. And it's almost there. 
I'm 31, that's like, that's pretty close. Uh, but I am not single. And I, I won't say how much I make. <laughs> um, but with information like this, it's it, both it's a potential to see how all of those apps, what, whether you have uh, Tinder on your phone, whether you have anything that's a, um, like a car ride service, like Uber or Grabcar, those things end up saying something about you because of who you are. And it ma makes it possible to guess who you might be. And that's the important thing. They're just guessing. So, but if it's getting me wrong, then what happens? Well, I might see ads like this for an anorexia study. This was on my Facebook, on the column on the side of my Facebook page. Now, when I see this, how am I supposed to react to this? What am I supposed to think about this? As a user, I know that those ads are targeted in some way. But to what extent they're targeted becomes, it's completely opaque to me, right? It could be based on two sets of information, like where I live and how old I am and if I'm a woman, maybe three. Or it could be based on like the entire corpus of my previous history on Facebook or throughout my browsing history. So what am I supposed to do when I see something like this? And I think that's where this stuff begins to matter, when it becomes sensitive, when all my time on Facebook then results in something like this, and how am I supposed to interact with that? And this is just one example, and it's one of the few times that I get to see just how sensitive that can be. And it's the case that, so data brokers, who are the ones kind of compiling one vision of who I am and selling it back to advertisers, are in the business of trying to make sense of who I am. They're drawing these inferences about what I, who I might be based on what I do. And they come up with some pretty sensitive subject matter that uh, an advertiser can buy this list for, or anyone else who wants to pay for it can buy it. And that's the tricky thing, is that on the one hand, it's, oh, it's OK to just say, like, oh, well, it's just an ad. Just ignore it. Doesn't matter. But if a loan broker buys that same information, what does that mean? And what, if, what does it mean that it's actually getting me wrong? So uh, the other day, I had opened up Netflix, and I had watched maybe a bunch of a few cartoons. Um, forget what it was. Uh, but all of a sudden, I open up Netflix and I have a kid. Like, where did this kid come from? And I can see, on the one hand, that Netflix is trying to uh, make my life easier. So I, they see the activity that somebody's watching a lot of kids' shows or cartoons, and it's probably likely that there's a kid in the house, right? And if I'm a busy mom, I don't have time to mess with the settings on Netflix, right? So I, can, I get that. But beyond the context of Netflix, what does it mean that now I have a kid? Is there any uh, sharing of that information? How do I know it's not being shared? And where is that potential to go and judge me elsewhere? And that's what it really gets down to. So <laughs> we're talking a lot about uh, um, virtual reality tools and play. And I think what, what I'm really trying to get at is that there are so many different ways that our play information is crossing contexts that we have no way to keep track of. And until we see something like an ad for anorexia, we don't really know how those things are talking to each other. And this is the kind of vision that, I'm blocking Mark. Um, <laughs> This is the kind of vision that gets me a little worried because you know, on the one hand, Oculus Rift is cool and interesting and there's lots of possibilities as to what we can do with uh, virtual reality tools, but like, what is Mark Zuckerberg's interest in these tools? And how, you know, what happens when the largest net, uh, database of social relationships and interactions mashes up with something that's about creating new worlds? It's an interesting possibility, and I'm sh there's going to be something uh, cool coming out of it, but do we feel comfortable with this? And 
how do we prevent ourselves from becoming this army of virtual reality drones for Mark Zuckerberg? So when I interact with my personal data, right now it feels like I'm interacting with a doppelganger. It's my data doppelganger. It's feeding me back things about me. It looks kind of like me, mostly like me. It's, but it's also, you know, has a kid or is single or all these fa fa factors about me that are not right. And I don't have any way of seeing the full picture. And even when I do, it's still a little fuzzy. So I think what I'm worried about in my future digital self I mean, this is my current digital self. It's not very clear. As we have more uh, devices and we're getting sensors on everything and we're being tracked in every different way, what does my future me look like if I don't have any control over it? And so rather than being this kind of presumptuous doppelganger that's out there in the world kind of creating my experiences and influencing what I see, I would so much rather have a future where I get to give my doppelganger the proxy to say, here's what I want, here's what I want more of. Right now, there's just so much assumption built into the system. So I think there are some ways right now that we can actually start to influence uh, what our data doppelgangers say about us, but also kind of influence the way that these systems are built going forward. Because as far as Facebook is concerned, we're all just happy to keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And until we start asking for things to change, they won't. So a couple con concrete examples. I can dig into my data. So whenever I see an ad, Facebook now has sh started to show us the details as to why I'm seeing an ad. So uh, this. Example, I saw something that was uh, for women between the ages of 25 to 35 in Singapore interested in infant. OK, so I'm not interested in infants. Thanks, uh, but no thanks. And uh, where did this come from? So I can drive down into the detail further, and Facebook will show me all the things that it thinks I'm interested in. And so these are all those inferences based on my previous history, what sites I'm going to, whatever. OK, so I get to start to look into this huge list. It's actually huge. It's kind of intense. Um, some of them are fine. They're pretty innocuous. OK, I'm interested in dance. Chinese New Year, yay, Singapore. Uh, water? Yeah, I'm, I'm a human. OK. Um, cervical vertebrae? What does that even mean? Like, where is that coming from? What are they going to advertise on, ba like, based on that factor? And why, what? Like, me and cervical vertebrae, that's totally one of my interests. So you can jump in there and look at this. And I think, so this is kind of absurd, but it's also really important because it's this uh, one of the few interfaces that we have to see what they think about us and what is being interpreted from all our stuff. You can also detox your data. So all of our data flows between these systems are what uh, is, is where those context um, boundaries start to break down. So you can go in and look at Facebook or Google or Twitter. And when you're using those to log into something, there's always a kind of setting page to say, actually, I don't want you to have access to that information. For the most part, they're sending a lot of information back and forth if you've just given, granted them access once. So it's worth it every now and then to do a checkup and say, like, OK, are we still good with this? Because I'm not even using this. Why, why do you get to have my data? The other cool thing that we can start to do if I'm feeling really paranoid is to drop red herrings into the data. This is dropping in information about me that just isn't about me at all. Obviously, we have a lot of information that's probably not about me, but like, why not take it a step further and just make it not me whatsoever? Um, this is called kind of an obfuscation tactic. And uh, an academic has written a really good book about this pretty recently. So what this does is 
uh, basically throws the whole system off my trail. Of course, that influences what I see after, and maybe it means that my system is more diverse and my results are um, less biased towards my preferences, if that's your goal. But it's the means that we have to kind of impact what we see. And until we get to pull the levers, or until the levers of what goes into uh, the algorithm to decide what we see, this is one of the only ways that we have to uh, adjust the system. And my final thing that I can do is to start asking for more of my data, demanding my data. So I have been playing a lot with uh, quantified self devices, self-tracking devices, things that are creating, putting sensors on our body bodies. And I bought my Fitbit, but I have to pay extra money to actually get an export of my data from Fitbit. That seems problematic. Um, and that's true of all these systems. Like As soon as we start putting all these smart devices in our homes and you know, s connecting all our uh, this car, like loyalty cards, and um, if we have a sous chef on our counter that is connected to the internet, you know, there's going to be all these different places where our data exists. But if we can't be the kind of central source of managing that, either uh, by exporting it or kind of having a means or some mega platform that allows us to manage it, um, we're just going to be in all these black box silos where we have no control over that information. So I would say you don't have to be a data scientist to start playing with your data. I'm not. And what I want to kind of leave you with is a spirit of creativity and kind of excitement to start digging into this stuff because I think that's kind of what we're missing as consumers is the interest or the, the concern about our information and what it says about us. So if we look at it with a sense of creativity and, and curiosity, uh, we can start to find out what actually matters to us about what, what this data says about us. So if we start to play with our data, then we can make sure that we're not being played. Thanks.